in order to understand earthquake precursors, we probably need to understand uh, where they originate from. Um, as you may know, the earth is made of what's called tectonic plates. They are plates that move around. So the, the earth's crust itself is not uniformly filled from continent to continent. So in addition to the oceans of the earth, the earth is divided into this series of plates that can move with respect to each other at very low speed, typically millimeters per second. It so happens that the, the earth needs this movement in order to breathe. But at the same time, this movement can sometimes create frictions at the interface between two plates where they become stuck. So you can think of two plates trying to move slowly with respect to each other. At some point, there's some deformation and they become stuck. That is what we call a fault. Now, as it turns out, the faults of the earth as a result of this deformation can accumulate considerable amount of energy over time because of the fact that they are stuck, they're trying to move with respect to each other and they accumulate energy. This energy can propagate sideways to the sides of the plates that become stuck. So earthquakes can be defined as a sudden movement. All of a sudden, this abnormality is fixed, if you could put it that way, and the plates move with respect to each other. So earthquakes are sudden movement of the earth cross, and it made in many directions. These movements are such that they provide or create mechanical deformations at the Earth's cross. So in the presence of earthquakes, that is a sudden motion, we can see that the movement is so sudden at the fault that it's very difficult to measure in time enough to provide the type of forecasting that we get like from, from the weather, for example. So from the standpoint of uh, earthquake forecasting, it would appear as if this is a very difficult, if not impossible problem to solve. But we must remember that people used to say the same thing about the weather, you know, um, you have a hurricane or a cyclone or snow or heat wave suddenly be upon us without any warning at all. But these days we see that we've developed effective forecasting methods that allow us to accurately forecast the weather over time. Earthquake precursors are a group of signals that originate from the pressure buildup along the fault. So like I was saying before, two plates become stuck. They accumulate pressure as they're trying to move with respect to each other. This pressure is distributed not only sideways to the plates themselves, but below under the plates. What the research has shown is that months to weeks before an earthquake begins, these rocks that accumulate pressure can become very electrically conductive. And as a result, electric charges begin to flow from under the Earth's surface to the Earth's surface and all the way to space. This flow of electric charge create a series of phenomena that produce up to 50 distinctive earthquake precursor signals that can be accurately measured. Uh, these precursor signals include voltage, electric field, magnetic field, and sometimes changes in water chemistry under the earth, air chemistry at the earth's surface, and changes in various changes in chemistry all the way to space, the atmosphere and atmosphere, zero to 40 kilometers above the Earth's surface, all the way to about 100,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So these precursor signals are a very interesting group of signals that unlike what we see in mechanical deformation of the Earth, where the measurement can take place only at the time where the movement occurs, these precursor signals start manifesting themselves months to weeks before an earthquake begins because they come in from this pressure buildup at the level of the fault. I started working on this problem in 2012. Um, I had started looking at the uh, earthquake in Haiti and 
particularly I was looking at the changes in above the Earth's surface that co correlated with the earthquake in Haiti, which was January 10, 2010. So in December 2013, I attended a, an American Geophysical Union conference, uh, which is one of the largest and most prestigious conferences in the fields of geophysics in the world, which was at the time held in San Francisco, California. So I went to present my first set of results on how, how months before the earthquakes in Haiti, you could have seen the changes of energy above the Earth's surface at about 200 to 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, the results were very well received by the scientific community, community, and this is where I had a conversation with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Friedemann Fun from NASA. Answering this discussion, this conversation, uh, we had several meetings, and that would start several productive conversations, which eventually would lead to uh, this very productive research collaboration between ENC and NASA. So over the last five years, ENC has been working very closely with NASA scientists on trying to advance the state of the art in science and technology of earthquake forecasting. I have personally been involved not only in the development of the science, but also more importantly in supporting the development of the technology that will be used to deploy instruments throughout the United States and the world. And we're hoping that these instruments, as we deploy them in specific areas, they'll be able to show the potential of this new approach to earthquake forecasting. Last summer, um, I was asked to uh, represent NASA at a geotechnical conference in Rome, Italy. I had the opportunity to participate in several conference presentations. I also had a chance to to meet some leading scientists in the field of geotechnical engineering, such as Dr. Armando Simonelli and his group from Senior University. So with the help of Dr. Simonelli, I was able to meet uh, the professor by the name of Mo Dolce, which is ba basically the director of the, of the Italian civil defense and many other prominent government offic officials and scientists working in the field. Since my visit to Italy, I've been working with Dr. Simonelli on looking at possibilities to establish and develop collaboration with his group. And this led eventually to this virtual summer, summer research opportunity. And because virtual summer research opportunity allow us to extend our arms to the outside, I clearly saw the opportunity to get uh, not only uh, it really involved many other people. So this virtual summer research clearly provides an opportunity to do both on-site and off-site research collaboration. It provides um, lots, lots of opportunities for the future. And in this short six week time period, uh, ENC and the Italian group have been able to effectively collaborate, work together, exchange knowledge base, and I think that has been a very promising result looking towards the future. Uh, I've created this summer research program, and in my mind, it was specifically designed to facilitate and promote student involvement in undergraduate research, because I believe undergraduate research is a key and fundamental part of uh, what I see as academic excellence. So our undergraduate research program in this way is very unique uh, in the sense that it gives us a real opportunity to develop our students' leadership as, as well as giving them research and analysis skills. Uh, the program distinguishes itself by using an open format. Students are provided with high-level guidance from faculty, but for the most part, they are expected to do a lot of work on their own. And that's how we think that they, they pick up these leadership skills and these research skill, independent research and analysis skills. The summer research program aligns well with our overall academic model in the science and technology division. A great aspect of this academic model is not only to rely on content 
education, but to use a context-driven education approach that can provide students not only with instruction on great academic content, but also what they need in the real world, primarily in the form of research and product development experience in order to succeed. So in addition to specific aspects of our curriculum that already deal with the context-driven education, such, such as the senior design, design course sequence that's embedded in all of our programs, we add summer research to the mix to give an extra dimension to our students in terms of their preparation for the world.